Good morning, everyone, and welcome to St. Elizabeth's Medical Center's Department of Neurology, third annual Spotlight on Parkinson's Symposium. Today, our symposium will explore and help you juggling you, your family, and Parkinson's disease. My name is Keith Ciccone, nurse specialist, and I am joined by my colleague, Afi Pockowell, nurse specialist. We are the nursing to support to both Dr. Anna Holler and Dr. Okinis Vau, as well as to the neurology clinic. We hope this finds you and your family well and safe to, during COVID. This year, our program comes to you virtually in a pre-recorded format. Our program this year is based on feedback from our patients, caregivers, and family. We hope this program provides you with insight, education, and resources that will be helpful to you, the patient, and the family around you. Please sit back, relax, and enjoy the program. Now, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Okanis Bao. Dr. Bao is the Director of Movement Disorders and Deep Brain Stimulation Program at St. Elizabeth's Medical Center. Her expertise is treating patients with Parkinson's disease, atypical Parkinson's, essential tremor, and other movement disorders. She's also a board certified sleep specialist and treats sleep disorders in patients with movement disorders. Dr. Bao is skilled in DBS and Botox injections. After receiving her medical degree from Samuel Weiss University of Medicine in Budapest, Hungary, Dr. Bao completed her neurology residency at New York Medical College and served as a chief residence there. She then pursued fellowships at Boston University School of Medicine in Movement Disorders and Sleep Medicine. She currently is the Clerkship Director at Tufts Medical School and Site Clerkship Director for Boston University School of Medicine. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bob. Thank you, Abby, for this, your wonderful introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm really excited to be speaking to all of you today about sleep. Sleep is very important. And patients who have Parkinson's do have quite a few sleep problems and sleep disorders. And we'll be talking about those today and also how to um, manage them. So about up to 90% of patients with Parkinson's have a variety of sleep disorders, sometimes more than one. Uh, they generally have a condition called REM behavior disorder, another con which we'll be talking shortly, uh, and, and they do complain of excessive daytime sleepiness, insomnia, the ability to fall asleep or stay asleep, and um, restless leg syndrome. These are some of the most common sleep problems patients complain about. About REM behavior disorder, what is it? It's basically um, a lack of normal muscle tone while people are dreaming in their what, what we call REM stage. And that comes out or manifests as dream enactment, acting out of your dreams while you are dreaming and asleep. Um, there are abnormal, very disruptive behaviors um, which do happen while you're dreaming and potentially can cause injury to the patient or to the, um, the bed partner. So um, it comes out as sometimes talking, people laugh, shout, yell, scream, they flail their arms, they punch sometimes, they kick. They can become very violent and can even fall out of bed and get injured. Um, it's either diagnosed just by description clinically or through a sleep study, overnight sleep study. A little bit about excessive daytime sleepiness, which we do hear a lot from our patients. Up to 50% of patients with Parkinson's complain of feeling tired and sleepy during the day. Now, this happens for various reasons, either because the um, arousal systems are impaired due to the disease, or there's a disruption of the circadian rhythm. Sometimes it's the medications, the, the, the dopaminergic medications that you take for your Parkinson's. It can be insufficient sleep at night, um, sometimes other sleep disorders such as sleep apnea or 
restless syndrome or sometimes exhaustion from your motor symptoms um, of Parkinson's disease. We do know that patients who have more severe Parkinson's disorder, more advanced, um, they're older in age, men, people who have dementia or depression, do feel more sleepy during the day. A little bit about insomnia, which is again very frequent. Uh, patients complain of having difficulties falling asleep, but mostly patients complain of difficulty staying asleep, as we call maintaining their sleep. Sometimes they wake up very early at 4 o'clock or 3 or, or 5 a.m. and can't go back to sleep. That's also considered part of um, the ins insomnia. And people feel very tired during the day and sleep because as a result of not sleeping well at night. We do diagnose patients with insomnia. If this has been going on for more than three months and they have trouble sleeping for at least three days, three nights a week. What causes patients with Parkinson's to have difficulty falling or st staying asleep? Um, there's many reasons that we really have to go through that checklist to see what is really disrupting the patient's sleep. Is it because they wake up frequently um, to urinate at night? Sometimes patients can wake up up to six times at night. That definitely is, is disrupting their sleep. They have tur difficulty turning over in bed because their muscles are very stiff. They have painful cramps. They may have very violent and um, violent nightmares. They could have what we call dystonia, like constant uh, contraction of their foot muscles or face, any which can be painful. Leg jerks, twitching of their legs. REM behavior disorder, like we talked about and also periodic movements um, of sleep, which is basically constant moving during sleep, not tremor, but leg movements. Um, patients who have depression or anxiety uh, or have been on levodopa therapy for quite some time have tr more trouble with staying asleep, not so much falling asleep. I want to also talk to you about restless leg syndrome and what that is, is to be able to recognize it because there's treatment. Um, it's an urge to move your limbs when um, the patient has a very uncomfortable sensation and they feel that they need to move their legs. And it usually happens during rest or inactivity. And that happens mostly at night in the evening. There, this uncomfortable sensation is partially or totally completely relieved by movement. So the sensation patients describe is variable. It can be creepy, crawly sensation, a tingly sensation, a burning sensation. Some people has to have described it like warm, warms in their feet or um, maggots in their legs. Um, it can come in different descriptions um, because it's not pain. It's an uncomfortable sensation. It usually affects most of both legs. I want to talk to you a little bit how to manage your sleep. Because sleep is very important, not um, only, of course, giving you a, a healthy, long sleep is very important in treating your symptoms of Parkinson's. <clears throat> a few tips on how to get to sleep, how to initiate your sleep. Make sure you go to bed at the same time every night and wake up at the same time every morning. Might make sure you get plenty of bright natural sunlight during the day, not close to bedtime, um, because that regulates your circadian sleep wake cycle. Make sure you avoid stimulants close to bedtime. Don't drink caffeine or um, um, nicotine, um, definitely it increases your inability to fall asleep. Make sure you don't get in heated discussion or watch any um, disturbing news close to bedtime because that will certainly keep you up. Make sure you have a, a, the same bedtime routine. The brain is a creature of habit and the, and the brain always likes the same routine which will prompt you to eventually get tired and sleepy and fall asleep. Make sure you go to the bed, your bedroom or to bed only when you're sleeping. 
to make sure you only use your bed for sleep. Otherwise, if you are in bed watching TV or um, reading for a long period of time, then your brain associates your bed with other activities and not just sleep. So it makes it harder for you to fall asleep. Avoid napping during the day. That definitely disrupts your ability to maintain a good nighttime sleep. And then if you still are in bed and you can't fall asleep for more than 15 minutes, make sure you just remove yourself from the bedroom and try to do a very um, uh, low-key activity meditation that may also may eventually cause you to feel sleepy and be able to go back to go to sleep. Now, a few steps on how to be able to how to make yourself able to maintain your sleep, stay asleep. <clears throat> make sure you your bedtime your your bedroom is quiet and dark and um, throughout the night, so light does not wake you up, because light does wake you up. And make sure that you avoid any heavy exercise, high intensity exercise, close to bedtime. So if you, we strongly recommend high intensity exercise that we just mentioned, but make sure you do this six hours before your bedtime. Avoid heavy light night heavy late night meals, especially if they're accompanied by alcohol. And um, make sure that your bedroom environment is right for sleep. We you want your bed to be comfortable, not very soft or not very firm. We you want your bedroom to be dark and we want it to also be in a cooler temperature, anywhere around 66, 62 degrees of Fahrenheit would uh, promote a good sleep. Avoid, when you wake up in the middle of the night, make sure you don't look at your clock. Because this creates anxiety and it really does not help you go back to sleep if you realize that you only have one hour until um, you need to wake up, then you will be constantly thinking about it and that will not promote sleep for sure. And another, if you're having trouble falling, um, so if you haven't, trouble turning over in bed and you're not you're waking up because of that you might want to consider satin sheets uh, which will help you glide and turn over better during the night a commode might be helpful if it's placed next to your bedside so as to minimize your trips from the bedroom to the bathroom if you're waking up frequently a few words on how to treat insomnia despite having done these preliminary measures to, that we just talked about, um, there's various medications out there and they've been, there's not one good medication for uh, treating insomnia. We definitely have to see it holistically. First of all, eliminate all the causes of insomnia. If you still have problems, then consider medications. And again, that's also personalized to each patient depending on their needs. Some of the um, geriatric, geriatric um, sleep medicine recommendations are the so-called Z drugs in the U.S. It's Zalpon, Zolpidem, Zolpidem, everything that contains a Z. Um, Tamazepam, Trizolam are some of the sleep initiation medications um, that will help you fall asleep. Although again, for Parkinson's disease, this usually is not a concern. It's mostly maintenance of sleep. So for maintenance, we recommend Zolpidem, Zolpidem, Doxamin is a very good medication. Uh, maybe a little bit harder to get approval from um, insurance. Tamazepam and Superexin has been proven to be very effective. A lot of people know about Trazodone, or many of you might be taking Trazodone. It's not highly recommended um, because it does cause uh, side effect of hangover um, sensation in the morning when you wake up. However, for those of you who are taking trazodone and feel that it helps, there's no harm in continuing taking it. Let's talk about how we treat restless leg syndrome. Um, first of all, you want to consider avoiding caffeine, alcohol. Certain medications can 
exacerbate restless leg syndrome such as antidepressant, SSRIs, etc. Some patients whose iron storage levels, which is ferritin, if, these are, if ferritin is low, may have uh, a high risk of developing restless leg syndrome and all they need is to supplement their iron storage levels. Dopamine agonists have been used to help with restless leg syndrome and this is very fortunate because it's also one of your Parkinson medications. Other medications that we do use is gabapentin and pregabalin. And last but not least, um, very rarely, if in, in, in tractable cases, in case we can't treat, we might use opioids. About brain behavior disorder that we were talking about, the uh, dream enactment disorder, there's a couple of medications that have been proven to work very well, but the major question is when do we start treating? And we want to treat when these activities, these behaviors during the night become violent and potentially dangerous for um, injury of the bed partner or the patient. So one of the medications we start with is melatonin at higher doses that you may be used to um, potentially 10 or 12 or even 20 milligrams have been effective. But uh, a much better medication is clonazepam. However, it comes with side effects of sedation and it's not the first medication we want to try, especially if patients have also dementia or some memory um, problems. Other medications to try is gabapentin. Levodopa has proven to potentially minimize brain behavior as well, um, but clonazepam and melatonin is the most effective ones. Uh, sometimes we use them in combination. I hope that was um, helpful for you to understand the different disorders of um, sleep disorders in patients with Parkinson's. This is our movement disorders team in San Luis Medical Center, and thank you all for listening. So we have some questions um, submitted by patients. I would like to go over with you. A patient of ours is asking, if I take a nap during the day, how long should it be? So that is a question that comes up very frequently. So some patients cannot fight falling asleep or taking a nap. And for these patients, I have to say, if you are starting to feel sleepy, you might want to go outside if you can. You might want to take a walk. Just try to wake your body and your brain up so that you eventually don't fall asleep. But if you really cannot fight it and you absolutely have to take a nap, make it short. Just a short power nap of up to 20 minutes would be fine. And only one, not more than one. Now, another question we got is, do you recommend everyone has a sleep medicine evaluation? The, the answer to that is uh, we probably want to, you probably want to assess this by your sleep medicine doctor or your neurologist whether you do need a sleep um, a sleep evaluation or um, a sleep study. If you feel that um, you snore or you wake up frequently at night gasping for air, you may have <clears throat> a condition called obstructive sleep apnea, which is diagnosed by a sleep study. If you have um, REM behavior disorder, you might want to tell your doctor, again, it can be diagnosed clinically, and you may also want to do a sleep study for that. We typically don't recommend a sleep study for patients who have insomnia, who can't sleep, because it really will not show us much. There is one other test that we do for patients who can't sleep. It's called actigraphy. It's, what, it's like wearing a, it's a wearable. It's like wearing your Fitbit and it records your sleep and your wakefulness. So we, over two weeks time, so we know how you've been sleeping and how many times you fell asleep during the day, if you did. So that's a nice objective way of monitoring your sleep over two weeks of, of your life. Um, another question is, when I wake up in the middle of the night, I am stiff and cannot move in bed, and sometimes cannot make it to the bathroom in time. What should I do for that? 
that is an excellent question and it comes up again very, very frequently. So when you wake up in the middle of the night, I will also add to that, sometimes patients have tremor and tremor prevents them from falling back, going back to sleep. So if you still have tremor or, very, are, or are very slow and you can't make it to the bathroom, that means you are very, as we call, off. So you are low on your medication. So you might want to talk to your doctor to start taking medications that will cover you throughout the night so you don't have those difficulties. Another question is, what do I have? Why do I have painful cramps in my arms and legs during the night? Very common. So that comes from, <clears throat> again, different reasons, but most commonly in patients with Parkinson's disease, it might be a sign that you are wearing off. Again, you're low on your medication, so you might want to boost your nighttime uh, with uh, either levodopa carbidopa or dopaminagnus, any kind of combination of your Parkinson's therapy. Another reason for painful cramps is it could be that you're dehydrated. Or you might be having restless leg syndrome, which again spoke about restless leg syndrome not presenting with pain, but it could be a uncomfortable sensation that you, the patient might be thinking it's pain. So um, I hope this was very helpful, and thank you again for listening. At this time, I would like to introduce Anna Dunbar. Anna Dunbar is the Director of Operations, as well as a coach and trainer at 110 Fitness. She is a certified personal trainer through the American College of Sports Medicine and is also an SCW Boxing Certified, Balanced Athlete Level 1 Certified, and certified as a Parkinson Cycling Coach. Anna has received 200 hours as a registered yoga teacher and received her training through Jackie Bonwell at the Sacred Seeds Yoga School. Anna received her certificate in clinical informed restorative yoga. At this time, I would like to introduce Anna, the benefits of holistic well-being practice for your Parkinson's disease. Anna. Thank you, Keith. Welcome, everyone. I'm very excited to be here to talk to you about the benefits of a holistic wellness practice for your Parkinson's disease. So what is a holistic wellness practice? Really, we want to have a comprehensive, all-inclusive, practice of everything that's good for you. So this includes things like stretching and balance and mobility and flexibility, as well as some strength training and some cardio and aerobic exercise and high intensity interval training as well. And of course, I have our little laptop up there because during this pandemic time, we're doing a lot of virtual exercises too, which we'll touch on a little bit. Uh, but first, I want to talk to you about the benefits of yoga for your Parkinson's disease. And of course, the topic of the symposium is all about juggling, juggling all the different things going on with your life as well as your Parkinson's disease, which can be a lot. Um, so what I want to talk to you about is the neuroscience behind yoga as well as the functional movement uh, benefits of your yoga practice. So I'm sure that you've heard Dr. Holler and Dr. Vow and a lot of people tell you that stress really exasperates your Parkinson's symptoms. So what we want to try to do is decrease that stress as much as possible while you're juggling all these other things going on in your life. So one great thing about yoga and a mindful practice is that it really helps your nervous system function at high capacity and helps keep your stress levels very low. So with your nervous system, you have your central nervous system and you have your peripheral nervous system. And what yoga does is it helps them work together very well and very um, effectively. And within your peripheral nervous system, we have your sympathetic nervous system, which is where your fight or flight reflex sits. And then we have your parasympathetic nervous system, which calms that anxiety, that fear, that fight or flight. So in a mindful yoga practice, we see the parasympathetic nervous system activate much more, and we see the sympathetic nervous system kind of stay at bay if you keep that practice ongoing and long term. And of course, with our yoga practice, we practice mindfulness, which is so important, especially when you're multitasking and have a lot of things going on with your life. And the benefits of that are really twofold for me. Um, it's important because you're very present in your day-to-day -day life. You're very attuned to everything going on with you emotionally. Um, but also, more practically, with your movement day-to-day, -day, if you're practicing mindfulness, you are very aware of everything going on in your body 
and it brings you from a conscious thinking to your kinesthetic awareness, which is really being aware of everything going on internally with you because it's operating so well and you're very alert and oriented. And then it helps you heighten the senses to become more aware of everything going on around you which of course you have Parkinson's disease, if you have some cognitive issues with your Parkinson's, obviously it's a movement disorder, so you might have some issues in moving about day to day. Kinesthetic awareness is very important to help you keep living your best life. So there have been research studies that show that long-term ongoing meditation and mindfulness practice actually shrinks the amygdala in your brain, which is that threat center. So it kind of keeps all that fear and anxiety at bay a little bit more, which is always very helpful. It's helpful to anyone, but it's especially helpful to people with Parkinson's disease. Also helpful for caregivers out there. You're also juggling a lot of things. And then there are also studies that show that we see a lot of activity in the left prefrontal cortex uh, with the mindfulness practice. And that's where the positive emotions sit in your brain. So obviously, we want to keep the negativity down and the fear down, and we want to increase the happiness and positivity going on in our life. And of course, if we have prolonged feelings of happiness, that's going to increase the dopamine levels in our brain, which dopamine is the magic word with Parkinson's disease. So we want to keep those levels up as much as possible, which is something that we see the effects of with your yoga practice. And additionally, if you have repeated sympathetic nervous system activity going on in your body, if your body is constantly kicking into a fight or flight state, um, that actually compromises your hippocampus, which is where your emotion, your memory, and your automatic nervous system kind of function. And we also see lower productions of dopamine as that SNS system keeps activating. So again, we want to keep all those good positive sites and uh, feelings up. And we want to do that because we have neuroplasticity in our brain. So obviously neuroplasticity, which we talk about a lot in these conferences and symposiums, and I've heard you, heard you talk uh, a lot with Dr. Holler and Dr. Vow about neuroplasticity. Um, it's your, your brain is ever changing. It's able to rewire and to change its routing, the way it's thinking at all times. And what we have is a negativity bias in our brain, which means our brain is always going to default to the negative thing in our life versus focusing on the positive things. So if we were having this symposium like we normally do in pre-pandemic times, and I was in this room and there were 100 people in here and 99 people were smiling at me, but if there was one person frowning at me, my brain is wired to just focus on that one person who is frowning at me because it wants to keep me protected because our brain hasn't caught up to modern times. It still thinks that we're you know, at the watering hole and there could be a lion that's gonna approach us and attack us. So it's trying to help us, but unfortunately at today's day and age, it's not super helpful all the time. So you're combating a hardwiring of our brain towards a negativity bias. So if we just focus on small positive things at all times, eventually you're gonna keep rewiring your brain to be positive and happy. I won't say all the time, but a better part of the time. You know, when you're faced with those decisions, where you go into a state of fight or flight, you're probably going to take a breath, take a pause, and just focus on the positivity and the silver linings of those things. And one other thing uh, that I wanted to mention with our yoga practice is that we do deep diaphragmatic breathing, and that diaphragm breathing actually calms our central nervous system, and it calms our parasympathetic, and it activates our parasympathetic nervous system, um, and that you know helps activate this parasympathetic nervous system as well. So we have all the neuroscience, all those good, happy things going on in our brain with your yoga practice. And then additionally, yoga practice can help your good functional movement, which is so important with your Parkinson's disease. And your functional movement is your everyday movement. It's you know sitting up, standing up, if you have to bend down to pick something, if you ever have to get up off the ground, these are the things you really want to focus on. And so a good, solid yoga practice, which doesn't have to be anything fancy, um, it helps create spinal column stability and extension, and it allows your spinal uh, column to rest and function in the state that it's intended to. And then additionally, again, we're creating that stronger connection between your central nervous system and your peripheral nervous system. And that helps you just function in your world throughout the day-to-day -day with your kinesthetic awareness. So yoga and mindfulness is something we practice at 110 Fitness. It's the largest center, uh, largest wellness center in the world for people with Parkinson's disease. Uh, we have a holistic approach, which we know the team at St. Elizabeth's has here as well. So we have our fitness classes, which are physical therapy based because the owner, Brett Miller, is a certified licensed physical therapist. 
we practice mindfulness, we participate in research studies, we are all about our community, our inclusiveness, we have fitness for all levels and all people. And then one big thing we've been focusing on is the virtual component during this pandemic, which I wanted to touch on briefly. You know, a lot of people are home for a very long time, some people are still at home, and we found it was really important to keep bringing yoga, boxing, um, plyometrics, stretching, all, all these different workouts to our community. Not only our 110 fitness community, but the entire Parkinson's community uh, every single day having something for them. So it's something if you haven't taken advantage of, I would urge you to take advantage of if you don't feel comfortable going back to a gym or wellness center. We have all of our virtual workouts. We have over 100 of them now up on YouTube and you can just search 110 Fitness uh, and we're there for you. You know, we have everything that you could possibly want, a lot of different fun things. Um, but we invite you to, you know, join the community. We send out an email every single day that has an update of all these different resources available to you, like this amazing symposium that we're having right now. We just want to keep the Parkinson's community very informed of everything going on. And then this fall, hopefully soon, we're going to be launching the 110 Fitness app, which is our virtual workouts just upgraded a little bit. So it's going to be the first Fitness and Wellness app for people with Parkinson's disease. We're very excited to bring it to the Parkinson's community. And again, it's just gonna be what we've been doing for the last six months, but upgraded, you know, 110%, as we like to say. So with that being said, if you have any questions or if you have want more information on 110 Fitness, on you know what you can be doing better for your Parkinson's with your wellness and mindfulness, our information's up here. And you can email me if you'd like at adunbar at 110fitness.org. And thank you so much. I appreciate it. At this time, I would like to introduce Kara Buckley. Kara Buckley is a physical therapist and brings 30 years of experience to her patients. She is currently the regional director of Fox Rehab. She has worked most of her career in geriatrics with focus on orthopedic and neuromuscular disorders and LSBT certified. At this time, I'd like to bring up Kara to talk to us about rehab in the home. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Dr. Bow and Dr. Holler for including me in today's symposium. I'm excited to be here and to explain to all who are watching the benefits of having physical, occupational, and speech therapy in the home. My company is Fox Rehabilitation. We are a Medicare B provider of outpatient services to geriatric clientele in their home. Our mission is that we believe in the strength of people. We bring on wonderful clinicians, train them well, to allow our patients the ability to achieve what they once thought impossible, to have optimal function and be as active in their home, with their families, and in their communities as much as possible. Um, at Fox Rehabilitation, we make geriatric house calls. Our clinicians provide clinically excellent care to older adults. What does this mean for your population, people watching this, both caregivers and patients? It means that we are able to come into your home work on what is specific for you in the environment that needs the work. For example, if you're having a hard time getting out of bed, we can actually go into your bedroom and work on that. If you want to participate in a virtual exercise class but are having difficulty using your iPad or computer to access that information, our occupational therapy staff can come in and work on that, as well as Zoom calls and being able to communicate with family and friends in this time of isolation. Not only do we work with movement disorders, we can help with any issue that might affect our geriatric population, which of course is Parkinson's, but as well as maybe some caregiver strain for those people caring for you in your home. Um, we can deal with any chronic issue, including pain from arthritis, muscle strain, those symptoms that come on with Parkinson's disease, including um, LSVT management. We can also do vital sign monitoring. So as we work with you, we make sure your cardiovascular system is up and running as well. We also work with pain management to help improve sleep movement quality. What we've noticed in our research is that with therapies for older adults, they have increased independence, reduced falls, and are hospitalized less. This allows our clientele to excel both with leisure and work activities 
and you utilize less medical services. We are outpatient therapy on wheels. We are Medicare B provider, and I know that's interesting to some people watching today. What that means is most insurances are covered 80% by Medicare, and the 20% is usually covered by any supplemental insurance you might have, Medicare, um, MedEx, Blue Cross Blue Shield, some of the AARP companies. Um, we are a little different from the Medicare A, VNA status as we don't require any homebound status. So if you are out and about enjoying maybe 110 Fitness, but having difficulty getting there, we can come in, treat you in your home, and then you can return to those activities once you have improved mobility. There is no hospitalization required or incident preceding the onset. We just need a doctor's referral for physical, occupational, or speech therapist. The other thing that I would like to talk about specifically with the Parkinson's population is we have speech therapy, which have LSVT loud certifications, and we have occupational and, and physical therapy, which also have LSVT big certifications. So what this will do is it will help you manage your Parkinson's disease in the home to benefit you from caregiver strain and to offer improved flexibility, sensory, motor learning, to decrease falls and improve quality of life. My name is Kara Buckley, again, I'm the Regional Director. My information is here if you'd like any more information regarding outpatient services in the home. Thank you so much. Now we will have a panel discussion on exercise and therapies, and I'd like to reintroduce Anna Dunbar, representing 110 Fitness, and Kara Buckley, representing Fox Rehab. The first question comes from our audience about COVID-19. Since COVID-19, I have not returned back to the gyms. Is it safe to return? And if so, what safety measures are in place? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Holler. That's a really great question. And I guess where I would start is to check with your gym and your facility to see what it is they're doing uh, to keep you safe. Every facility is a little different in both size and number of members. Uh, so you want to check in and make sure and see what protocols and procedures they have in place. If they are open, they have to have protocols and procedures written out in place that you can look at. Uh, so if you feel any sort of concern, just check in uh, with your gym or wellness center. At 110 Fitness, we are open, we are operating, we are following all proper CDC and state guidelines to keep all of our members very safe, very healthy, wearing masks, staying socially distanced, and there's a whole lot of cleaning going on to keep everyone very healthy. Uh, we're very fortunate um, because we do have a slightly bigger space and we do have a very good air ventilation system, which is very important during these times. And there actually have been a few studies that have come out uh, doing research and testing in gym facilities to see if the likelihood of you getting COVID is increased being in a gym versus other places. And so far, uh, there's been no indication that there's any higher risk to catching COVID in a gym versus if you're going out to dinner or anything like that. Um, those are short-term studies, so I would take them with a grain of salt. But again, I would just look in, talk to the owner of your gym or wellness center. Uh, but again, there are a lot of great other virtual options out there for you as well. And then is it safe to have therapists in my home? What are the safety precautions that Fox Rehab is putting into place to help keep the patients safe in their homes? Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Yes, Fox in particular, we take our PPE very seriously. We're very stringent in what we do. Um, all therapists obviously use great hand hygiene before donning or taking off their PPE. We all wear surgical face masks also face shields or goggles, so we have protection for eyes, nose, and mouth. For those patients who are able, we ask them also to wear a uh, mask. That way, CDC says with those three things in place, again, with good hand hygiene, the ability for the virus to spread is very limited. Thank you both. We know that exercise can slow the progression of Parkinson's disease, and there have been numerous studies looking at dopamine scans, for example, different types of motor metric functioning, also different cognitive tests that help to reveal that all these things can be improved with exercise. How much exercise should a patient get each week? 
and what types of exercise are recommended? Another great question. So the research studies show with high intensity exercise that you should be getting at least two days a week. Two days is the bare minimum for the exercise to be effective and help slow the progression of your Parkinson's disease to see any sort of long lasting effects. Um, however, we normally say two to three days, but really I would say try to do something every single day of the week if you can. And when I say that, I don't mean that you have to go beat up a punching bag and work incredibly hard for an hour every single day, but it's really good just to get your body moving up and moving every day. You know, definitely do high intensity exercise. Um, the research that we showed to be the most effective, effective for your Parkinson's is high intensity boxing, non-contact, no head contact please. Um, and then also cycling, keeping your RPMs up between 80 to 90 RPMs. Uh, so those are the things you want to focus on, getting done at least two to three days a week. And then the other days, you know, maybe go for a run if you're able to, uh, go for a bike ride, go for a long walk, do some yoga, practice a little meditation. There's all sorts of different things you can do, but you just want to keep your body moving. Uh, but that high intensity is key to help slow the progression of your Parkinson's disease. Thank you. And Kara, in terms of home therapies, can you tell us a little bit about the physical therapy treatments that can be used, such as gait and balance therapy for our Parkinson's patients, occupational therapy, addressing their activities of daily living, and then a little bit more about the Lee Silverman voice therapy technique. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, we also agree that moderate intensity, uh, research shows 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity is what causes physiological changes. So what we do in the home with um, Parkinson's people, I am a physical therapist, so what we do is we do a lot of large amplitude movements, trying to reset the sensory integration part of your brain to allow you to move maximally. Um, we also, with occupational therapy, we work specifically on activities of daily living, but we try to bring it to a higher level. So we might add in a balance component while you're trying to do carry your uh, coffee across the room and maybe throw in a cognitive component because we don't live in isolation. We're trying to carry that cup of coffee while our grandkids are running around or we're maneuvering around a dog. Um, the LSVT loud program is um, excellent. So what that is, we have several speech therapists that are certified in that. And what that works on is not only amplitude of voice, but it's duration of voice that helps you really be able to be understood. It goes back to that sensory motor connection that the effort you put out to make your voice loud enough might be higher than you think it should be based on the Parkinson's progression. So it's, it's a wonderful program that allows you to be heard throughout your daily life. Thank you so much. And now for those individuals who are interested in online options, can you discuss a little bit of the options that are available for online for patients interested in exercising? Sure. Uh, so at One Tech Fitness, we completely virtualized our program during the height of the pandemic, and we were so excited to do so because we know that movement is so important for people with Parkinson's disease, and we wanted to keep, try to keep the community up as well as much as we could keep everyone together. So on YouTube right now, you can find over 100 workout videos uh, that have been pre that were recorded for you. All you have to do is go to youtube.com and look up 110 Fitness and you'll just see, like I said, it's about 110, 120 videos. There's everything from boxing to yoga to stretching. There are actually some voice work up there, which is really great. And just a whole lot of different options for you, something for everyone. And a lot of our workouts, um, our boxing workouts, we do some fun uh, drumming, aerobic workouts. We have them shown in both standing and seated. So they're both modifications, so there's something for everyone. So if you're at home and you're thinking, you know, I don't move as well and um, I might not be able to stand up and throw those punches, you can do them in seated with me. I'm normally the one doing the seated modification. Uh, so there's a lot, a lot of fun to be had. And there's also a lot of other great programs out there, um, a lot of different organizations providing virtual workouts. And so each day 110 Fitness is sending out an email called the 110 Daily Grind and it's just a whole list of resources available to you um, of different workouts, of different webinars, of different support groups and things like that. Uh, so there's something for everyone out there, absolutely. Thank you, and our last question is, how do I get in-home services coordinated? You 
have my contact information from this presentation, but the best thing to do is just speak to your physician. All we need is a physician's order to get things started. We would do a full el eligibility check with your insurance to see if there is any monetary contribution required. Um, you can always go to foxrehab.org and contact us through that website as well. Well, thank you both for your participation today and for answering these patient questions. And we appreciate having you today. Thank you. At this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Anna DePaul Puller. Dr. Puller joined St. Elizabeth's Medical Center from Boston Medical Center in November of 2017 as the first female chair of neurology. She has also served as the director of medical student education for student health care. She is the assistant dean, St. Elizabeth's Medical Center affiliate site at Boston University School of Medicine and a professor of neurology at Tufts University School of Medicine. Dr. Poehler completed her undergraduate and her medical degree at Boston University in a seven-year accelerated medical program. She then completed her internship and residency in neurology at Madigan Army Medical Center in Tacoma, Washington. After eight years of distinguished military service for the United States Army, she was just honorably discharged, having received the rank of major. She then completed a fellowship in movement disorders at Boston Medical Center. At this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Holler. She will talk to us today on Parkinson's disease and driving, when to hit the brakes. Dr. Holler. Thank you, Keith, for that introduction. Today I'll be speaking about Parkinson's disease and driving. This is a common question that we get from our patients, trying to understand what they can do to help continue to drive and when they should stop driving. So we'll talk first about understanding the impact of Parkinson's disease on driving, then optimizing our functioning to maintain our independence, and finally I'll go through accepting the need to stop driving when appropriate. So many people associate driving with independence, and so the loss of driving ability makes people feel like they have lost functional ability, ability to interact socially with others, and really takes a blow, that causes a blow to their ego. And what we think about as providers in terms of evaluation of driving is safety. And so we're thinking about the individual safety and also the safety of the community. So physicians make the determination about when the patient is no longer safe to drive, but typically they're utilizing a lot of additional information to make that decision. Some of the information is obtained from history, physical examination, at times referral for an occupational therapy assessment, and very importantly, information from family and friends as to how driving has been impacted. And so our goal is to keep people driving as safely as possible for as long as possible. We think about driving safety just like we do with gait and balance safety. So when people are starting to have trouble with their walking and they're starting to fall, we want to know about it so that we can intervene early. The same thing with driving. If people are having a little bit of trouble either not being able to see as well at night or getting lost when driving, we want to know early so that we can put steps in place to try and help to preserve or adjust driving to keep people safe behind the wheel. So how does Parkinson's disease affect driving? In terms of cognition, individuals can have difficulty with their memory, they can have trouble with multitasking, and they may also have trouble with visual spatial processing, which can lead to difficulties with three-dimensional assessment. How far is the car ahead of me? How long is it before I have to start slowing down for the stop sign, for example? Vision can be impacted by Parkinson's, particularly night vision. So night vision driving can become difficult, even early in the early stages of Parkinson's. In addition, people can have a change in their visual acuity or their seeing and may need new prescriptions earlier than they anticipate. Their reaction time can be slowed, not just in their arms, but in their legs, and particularly on the side that's most affected by the tremor. Movement of legs and arms can be affected. People can be stiffer, they can be more slowed, and the tremor can impact their driving abilities and coordination. And then in terms of their balance, individuals can have difficulty getting into the car, getting out of the car, and it is not uncommon to hear of patients having trouble falling when getting out of the car. 
In addition to the motor and cognitive impacts of Parkinson's, individuals can also have trouble from medication side effects. So some of the Parkinson's medications can cause sleepiness, some can cause drops in blood pressure associated with lightheadedness, and individuals can have excessive movements from their medication called dyskinesias, which can make it difficult for them to coordinate their driving as well. So how do we preserve our driving functioning? And we rely quite a bit on family members and friends to help get the initial assessment as well. But when patients are in the car, we want them to eliminate driving distractions. So what that means is turn off the radio, turn off the cell phone, try not to be in very deep or heavy discussions with other members in the car as well, which can be distracting. And then also work on trying to concentrate on the drive. If they're going to a place that's unfamiliar, we recommend that they review the directions ahead of time as well. So they aren't surprised with the sudden left. In addition, we recommend that people drive during ideal weather conditions. So you should avoid driving during heavy rain, snow, hail, or strong winds. Those situations cause extra stress and strain on cognitive, visual, and motor systems. In addition, patients should not drive when fatigued or when their medication is wearing off. And so planning drives can be important in terms of when a person is feeling at their physical and mental best. We want individuals to choose familiar, comfortable routes during non-peak driving hours. So you don't want to be trying a long drive in the middle of rush hour, for example. And we recommend a GPS for individuals, particularly getting them comfortable with it at first before they are going to unfamiliar areas. We recommend avoiding long drives, and by that we typically mean anything more than 45 minutes to an hour, and we recommend individuals take frequent stretch breaks to use the bathroom and to help with their flexibility of their arms and their legs. So how do we know when an individual is having trouble with their driving? We typically recommend that a family member or friend drives in the car with them, and we ask that this individual pay close attention to the following things whether or not the individual is keeping with the pace of traffic. Uh, we do not want individuals driving much slower or much more quickly than the actual speed of traffic. We want to make sure that individuals are switching lanes appropriately, signaling ahead of time and allowing for enough space between cars when changing lanes. Another important thing to know is individuals should plan for getting off at an exit ahead of time and not at the last minute. We want individuals to not slow down or stop for unknown reasons. It should be slowing down and stop for the appropriate times, stop signs, red lights, etc. We want to observe whether or not individuals are getting lost on familiar roads or if they forget during the course of the drive where they're supposed to be going. We want to observe whether or not individuals are tired when they're driving. And also, of course, we want to know if people are having any troubles with the car when they're driving. So examples would include any fender benders, even if the individual is not at risk in terms of the one who contributed to the accident. Being involved in the accident in general, we need to know about. Individuals who are running over curbs, hitting mailboxes, hitting parked cars, or having difficulty navigating into or out of the garage, we want to know about as well. And so the patient will present to our clinic office and we'll ask about driving and then we'll do a battery of tests to try and assess these different factors that I mentioned before. So one of the things that we do is cognitive testing, paper and pencil testing, memory testing, drawing patient, having drawing testing as well. These help us to assess things like visual, spatial, memory, multitasking abilities. We do our motor testing to evaluate strength and flexibility in the limbs. We do our coordination testing, which also helps to assess reaction time. And then our gait and balance testing to evaluate safety, also getting in and out of the car. In addition, the neurologist may recommend a driving safety evaluation by an occupational therapist certified to do this. And what that would involve is a written test and potentially a road test as well. Typically, neurologists will give three different recommendations. One would be you can drive without restrictions. The second one would be you can continue to drive but with certain limitations. And then the 
other recommendation would be that there's no more driving and that's in situations where the safety of the individual and or the community is at risk. So these are some initial guidance that we often give to our patients. One thing that I typically want to know about is whether or not an individual would like a handicap placard. This may help to preserve their strength and energy so they aren't walking a far distance getting in and out of um, stores and things like that to help preserve their strength for the drive. I might recommend that an individual only drive in daylight hours or under ideal weather conditions. I might recommend that an individual only drive within a certain radius of their house or only with someone in the car familiar with those areas. Now if you have been given the guidance to not drive anymore, we want to think about what do you do next? So who can I call to help with transportation? Obviously, family and friends are available. In addition to that, we have the advantage of car services, such as Uber, Lyft, and obviously the taxi service as well. In addition to that, individuals who need to get to their appointments can apply for a PT1 form where transportation can be arranged from their home to their physician's office. In addition, there are additional resources, such as the Easter Seals Project Action, elder care locator, and the disabled American veteran services, which can provide transportation. Additional resources about driving can be found on the Parkinson's Foundation website under driving and under the Davis Finney Foundation website under how long can I keep driving if I have Parkinson's disease. And again, our goal is to keep you driving safely. And so the earlier we know about any difficulties that you're having with your driving, the earlier we can intervene with cognitive therapies, medication adjustments, physical therapy, and occupational therapy as needed. So now we have some questions from our patients. The first one was, can I get a driving evaluation before I'm told I need to consider giving up my license? And that's a great question and the answer is yes. So the driving assessment does not necessarily need to be at a time when we're worried about whether or not we need to help have you stop driving. The driving assessment done early can help to provide you additional insight about where your weak points are so that programs can be put in place with the occupational therapist about how to modify your driving to optimize your functioning. The next question, does each state have their own guidelines about driving or is it pretty much the same for all states? So each state has its own guidelines in terms of uh, when people should stop driving and how it's reported. Some states require that the physician report, other states require that the patient report. So it's helpful for you to discuss that with your physician. Another question, my license was suspended by my primary care physician, what can I do? So the biggest thing is to figure out why it was suspended. Was there a particular incident or was there a pattern of uh, difficulties that was identified by the primary care physician. And then the discussion about a driving assessment is typically ideal in those situations. The next question, my children said I should not be driving since my diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. I'm 53 years old and still working. Now what? So although we have input from families and friends about recommendations for driving, typically what we want to do is do a driving assessment to be able to say objectively whether or not somebody should or should not be driving. And so in this case, that's what we would recommend, to be able to provide clear guidance about what restrictions might need to be put in place. Many cases, we are able to keep people driving with just some limitations in terms of their either distance or in terms of their activity level. And people don't necessarily need to stop driving right off the bat unless there's some particular difficulty identified. The next and final question is, what positive things can I do to continue to be able to drive? And we love this question. So anything that helps in terms of your cognitive ability, so reading, interacting with friends, um, conversations with individuals about particular topics can help keep your mental status activity active. That's very important. Seeing your eye doctor regularly to make sure that your prescription is optimized and identify whether or not you are having difficulties with low vision situations, that's obviously useful as well. And then in addition to that, therapy such as physical therapy and occupational therapy that can keep you at your functional depth and best and potentially with medication optimization will be very useful in terms of preserving your driving. 
So thank you for your questions today, and we look forward to seeing you soon. It's my pleasure to introduce Ms. Leslie Vickers. Leslie Vickers is a nurse clinical specialist, master's prepared and certified as a rehabilitation registered nurse. She has specialized in the care of patients with a neurological disease di diagnosis and their families for well over 30 years. Leslie is the owner of Dependable Healthcare, which is a care management company with a primary focus on the movement disorder population and their families. She has been a support group leader for four different Parkinson's disease support groups, one for 20 years. She has continued this coordination more recently in a virtual format. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Leslie Vickers. Hi, and thank you. Um, as a care manager, um, for many, many years. I'm here to talk to you about how to pull all the pieces of care together. And as you can see on this slide that's up there, many times there's considered fragmentation of care. How do you put the puzzle pieces together for the caregiver or the person diagnosed with Parkinson's disease? There's so many opportunities nowadays. There's um, rehab, PT, OT, speech, but how do you access that? Is it in an outpatient setting? Is it in a facility? Is it in home care? You see your primary care physician. Primary care physician has pieces of your general health information. You get referred to a movement disorder specialist, which focuses on your symptoms, of Parkinson's disease or like disorders, do they talk? Is that information coordinated? You may see a specialist, a medical specialist, like a cardiologist or an oncologist, a urologist, and they treat symptoms in their specialty area. But again, are they being relayed to the movement disorder specialist or to the primary care physician? How do you know if the information and the direction that the cardiologist is sending you in for necessary treatment and interventions will match the plan that the movement disorder specialist has? So as a caregiver, you're left with trying to figure out all the different pieces. If you need to go to the hospital, for example, how do you navigate that system? as a caregiver for the person with the movement disorder. Who do you contact? And nowadays, with the virus, we have limited visitation opportunities. And if you go through the emergency room, there's really less communication that's taking place. So how do you get through? How do you know what's going on? <clears throat> Should you assume that care is just being provided and it's always in the right direction? I think that it's important that you recognize there's still questions that come up. What's happening? Did my um, person that's important to me receive their Parkinson's medicines when they're supposed to receive them? So who is that person that you contact? There is a system in the hospital where there's a nurse navigator many times, and so that's the person that you would connect with. In home care, you're referred to home care for services. Um, is that skilled home care? Is that private home care? Is that home care which meets eligibility criteria for you to receive? So questions come up with all the um, opportunities that you have. Support groups um, actually are great. <laughs> they, um, no one should be, um, dealing with Parkinson's disease or like disorders alone. And it is an opportunity to meet other people and to talk to um, other people in similar situations. And this is for the caregiver and for the person with Parkinson's disease. So my role as care manager is to assist families, caregivers, person with movement disorders or, <coughs> or like disorders, to navigate, to advocate, to educate, and to help establish realistic goals. 
Now the goals of the, <clears throat> the person with the movement disorder and the goals of the caregiver may not be exactly the same. So my role would be to assist um, in bringing them closer together. The family, the extended family, <clears throat> which is um, there many times to be helpful, has different goals again. So it's pulling that together so that eventually we come up with a coordinated set of goals and a team that's developed and there's communication across all lines. <clears throat> the goal, the general goal in care management is to coordinate care. <clears throat> and as you can see in the middle here, we've joined hands, we're a team now. We're working together. We've got everyone circling around to make sure that the support that the caregiver and the person with the movement disorder um, diagnosis has. So if there's a recommendation for short-term rehab, it's this team knows how to navigate that system, what that means, how long someone would be receiving um, short-term rehab in a facility, for example. This team in the center that's been developed would be able to talk with the cardiologist, the specialist, and again with the movement disorder specialist, or coordinate that back through the primary care physician. If home care is involved, that team that's been developed would be able to know what the resources are and better paid for by insurances, what private insurance, what private care might need to be activated, <clears throat> and what is available through um, um, for home <laughs> stop, <clears throat> and what is available through um, eligibility, financial eligibility for home care um, activation. Um, there are assisted livings that are available for people, but what is the right type of assisted living? Why do you look at one assisted living versus another? If you are anticipating that there will be a need in the future of a long-term care facility, how do you navigate that? How do you um, know where to go, what you're looking for, who to talk to? So again, that's the role of the care manager, jumping in there with the caregiver and the person diagnosed with the movement disorder. So, stop. <clears throat> okay. So again, as um, care manager, my role would be to coordinate the care of the person and the caregiver. Allow them to be able to create some respite time for the caregiver. Allow them uh, <clears throat> by giving them permission and setting up opportunities for them to be able to exercise, for them to go out um, with their friends, to do all the things that Irene had um, also recommended. Um, but it's organizing and creating efficiency in um, that person with the movement disorders diagnosis care. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Irene Piritinsky. Dr. Piritinsky is a licensed clinical neuropsychologist with years of clinical experience. She completed an American Psychological Association APA approved clinical psychology PhD program an APA-approved internship at the Bedford VA, and two years of clinical neuropsychological, sorry, can I start again? Yeah. <clears throat> it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Irene Piritinsky. Dr. Piritinsky is a licensed clinical neuropsycholo neuropsychologist with years of clinical experience. She completed an American Psychological Association APA approved clinical psychology PhD program, an APA approved internship at Bedford VA, and two years of clinical neuropsychology fellowship at Brown University. 
At Butler Hospital in Providence, she was part of the Movement Disorder Program, which specialized in caring for patients with Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, gait disorders, tremors, drug-induced movement disorders, ataxias, dystonias, and other movement disorders. Dr. Piritinsky assesses clients with a diverse range of clinical difficulties. She conducts neuropsychological assessments, as well as offers cognitive rehabilitation therapy and support groups for patients with movement disorders. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Piritinsky. So what I'd like to do is talk to you about the caregiver burden. This topic comes up a lot. Um, we uh, end up thinking of our patients most of the time, and we are always attuned to needs of caregivers, and uh, we want to make sure that we take care of them as well, because they're the ones who are going to be taking care of our patients. Um, so what I'd like to start is thinking about what are some of the feelings that uh, caregivers are reporting to us that they're experiencing? And they're telling us that they feel overwhelmed, they feel frustrated with behaviors, with changes that are going on in their partners. They feel exhausted because at times they're not able to get enough sleep. Um, they feel that at times they're reluctant to take on a role as a caregiver, or they're reluctant to actually accept the fact that their uh, family members, loved ones, are going through so many changes. They feel grief, um, they feel irritation, there's sometimes lack of fulfillment. Um, sometimes they feel that they're not loved, and they're not loved as much as they used to feel loved. There's decreased level in satisfaction which leads to feeling depressed and anxious and worthless. Sometimes caregivers report that they get angry and mad and that makes them feel guilty. Um, they feel anger towards their own guilt that they're experiencing and they feel guilty towards the, um, how they're responding sometimes to their, care, to their uh, people who they care for. There's imbalance that they're experiencing in the care they're providing. They feel like it might have been 50-50 or they did most of the chores, but some of the chores were done by the person that they're now caring for. And now they have to kind of do it all. Um, they feel stress, resentment, and at times they feel trapped. They feel like there's no way out. Um, when we think about caregiver burnout, uh, what I often talk to my caregivers about is, you often don't even know how you get there. It's not that you wake up one day and say to yourself, now I'm burdened, now I feel stressed. It kind of happens gradually. And there is this both emotional and physical toll that our caregivers are experiencing. They're at a much higher, um, have higher stress level um, than those who are not caregivers. Um, they feel like they're always on the call. They feel like something could happen any moment. The caregiver would say to me, I finally was able to go out with my friends, but then my wife calls and I have to be immediately available. And if, they, and if she doesn't call, then I'm sitting there with my friends expecting that phone call to come through. They're unable to do things they enjoy because of that feeling of guilt. Um, so they're canceling their meetings with friends. They're uh, not participating in chess uh, or checker games that they used to enjoy on a weekly basis. There's this role reversal that happens, uh, which also contributes to this caregiver burden. You don't expect to become a caregiver um, at an early age sometimes, and when that happens, that contributes to additional caregiver bur burden um, and stress. So some of the factors that I thought would be interesting to bring up, women end up being caretakers more than men. Certainly that changes, uh, statistics change, but for now women are um, at a higher um, rate of becoming caregivers. Uh, typically, we know that if you're living with a person who you're caring for, you're more likely to experience additional level of distress. There's usually financial strain. You end up hiring private providers. You end up working less because you have to take care of someone else. 
um, in the family. Uh, feelings of depression and isolation certainly make you a less productive caretaker. Uh, the number of hours that you spend caretaking for someone um, impacts the level of caregiver burden. And certainly, um, it's not always two family members that are dealing with this. There are other family members that we have to be thinking about, and they might sometimes have different opinions from uh, the caregiver's opinion. So we have cousins, we have brothers and sisters, um, in-laws who could get involved and provide uh, at times useful feedback, but how that feedback is received by a caregiver uh, could look very different from the intention that um, others have. Um, certainly, one of the things we know is that compared to care caregivers of people without dementia, twice as many dementia caregivers indicate substantial emotional, financial, and physical difficulties. So what are some of the signs that we're on the lookout for? Um, and like I said, we don't often have caregivers coming in and screaming for help. But there are certain things we look for and questions that we like to ask. Uh, we ask about weight changes. We ask if they've been feeling sadder than usual, more depressed than usual. We ask about their sleep patterns. Have they been sleeping more? Have they not been getting enough sleep? Have they been napping more frequently during the day? We ask about substance use. Uh, is this someone who's a caregiver and is in the recovery but has had few relapses? Is this someone who used to go to AA meetings and now they're missing them more than they used to? Is this someone who's just noticing that he, they used to go through a bottle of wine in a week and now it's a bottle of wine with dinner? Um, is there a drug use increase? Are they using drugs recreationally more than they should do? And most importantly, is it contributing to any level of functional impairment? Um, we'll look for signs of body pains and aches. We ask our patients, you know, how are you feeling in general? And we hear from caregivers that they feel like their body's aching. They kind of feel that physical exhaustion and they can't pinpoint where that pain is coming from. They feel um, overwhelmed and so we usually ask them have, what happened to your activities and they would say, you know, I had to not go to this party that I was invited to because I just felt overwhelmed. Um, loss of interest. Uh, we have caregivers who used to bike or who used to be part of book clubs and they're no longer interested in these activities. So we're looking for that change um, in their behavior. Difficulty making decisions. We'd hear from caregivers, they would say to us, I was amazing at making decisions. I was the one other people would come to and when I have to make a decision on my own, I'm able to do it. And now they're questioning themselves. They're not certain about things that should really just take a few minutes to make decisions about. Um, some of the statistics, I don't want to bore you, but I did want to put numbers there. More than 34 million of unpaid caregivers provide care to someone age 18 or up. Uh, we know that more than half uh, of caregivers said that they do not have time to take care of themselves, both physically and emotionally. Um, we also know that our caregivers don't attend their own doctor's appointments as much as they used to. They cancel their visits with their therapist. They uh, ignore going to groups that they used to enjoy going to. And certainly they're missing their physicals. And when they feel that something is going on with them, where it would require a visit to a specialist, so they would see a primary care physician. The primary care physician would say, hey, go see that neurologist or go see the dermatologist. They're less likely to follow up with that advice. So what do we want you caregivers to do about this? We want you to kind of take a step back and realize that we need you to be strong, we need you to be physically and emotionally healthy, um, and we need you to be able to, if need be, to take that caregiver role, but not to lose yourself in the process. So things that we consider good for you are physical involvement, so doing some stretching, making sure that you're exercising, walking, finding a friend that would walk with you would be great. Um, emotional support, um, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but stress management, encouraging you to maybe read a little bit more on coping strategies, talk to other people about what worked for them. Journaling is a great way of putting your thoughts on paper. Um, sometimes we say to our caregivers, if you have trouble falling asleep because you have all these thoughts running through your head of what you have to do the next day or the next week, put them down on paper and just leave that journal next to you so you can always write down your thoughts. Um, spiritual support is really important. Um, if it's church, if it's synagogue, if it's mosque that you go to, find that support there and um, it can be a nice way of relieving uh, stress. Uh, hobbies are a great way of getting distracted. Uh, painting, reading, uh, going for hikes, 
Um, you can find your own religion anywhere, even in the mountains. Um, having a safe space, a space for you that only belongs to you, and it could be as little as a corner with some cute cushions around, but anything that would provide you with your own space that you feel like you can go to and feel safe. Certainly finances are easier to talk about than done. That's something that we always uh, think about hiring or looking at finances and making sure that um, you are in a position where you can take care of yourself and take care of others is important. Making sure that you're budgeting, making sure that you are uh, managing your bills. Um, sometimes uh, it's as easy as setting things on auto pay, uh, which I, I'm usually surprised when I talk to caregivers about this. Um, how many just haven't thought about it because they're so overwhelmed, um, they're still writing out checks where they could be setting themselves up for um, automatic bill payment. Management with work, a lot of our caregivers work. A lot of our caregivers either babysit their grandchildren or have full-time jobs or part-time jobs. What do you do when you need to take care of someone and your boss tells you you have to work? So having open communication with people that you work with um, and for is really important. Um, and setting your schedule so that you are setting yourself up for success. Um, some additional factors to be thinking about, and the way that we try to talk to our caregivers about this is think one step ahead. So even if you're not even close to talking to your family members about um, talking, moving and transitioning to adult daycares or moving onto dementia units, Think about these things ahead of time. It's much easier when you have time. It becomes a lot more difficult when in a minute you have to come up with respite care or daycares or adult daycares or um, dementia units. So if you have time to be thinking and coming up with a list of places that you might want to visit, talking to family members, friends who've had experience with different facilities, is certainly helpful because then you're not doing it alone and at the last minute. I guess the point is ask for help and ask for help in advance. So one of the questions we always get is, what, is it, what, what are we gonna do during the holidays? And certainly COVID turned everything upside down and holidays took on their own meeting of uh, meeting with family members over Zoom and how is my patient with dementia going to handle the Zoom? How are they going to stay focused? Can they even turn on the computer? So certainly a whole other slew of issues. Uh, what we've been recommending is if possible, if it's safe, find a way to get a family member involved, even if it's through Zoom. So setting up a session of Zoom that wouldn't last maybe for three hours, as it would with the rest of the family members, but maybe having five-minute sessions with each grandkiddo, or having five-minute session with a sibling, so that it's one-on-one -on -one contact, it's less overwhelming, and it allows our patients to feel like they're involved showing and sharing pictures from the holidays if they were not able to attend because of safety concerns or because of traveling restrictions, um, getting them a, 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 an album so that they can look through that album and even maybe talking to them about which family members are going to be on Zoom that they're gonna be talking to so they're not forgetting their names, they're not forgetting how they're related to each other is certainly helpful. Still, families do travel, and families do take their family members for holidays. And one of the things that sometimes comes up is what happens during conversations when a family member all of a sudden loses their train of thought. And you have this family member who's not um, super insightful, maybe, and says things like, well, we just talked about it, Grandma, or don't you remember us having this discussion a week ago? Sort of gently redirecting and um, finding ways to maybe move discussion somewhere else, but not focusing on the fact that our patient lost their train of thought would be helpful. Um, finding ways to prepare families, sometimes having a discussion with family members before um, and kind of telling them about what does it mean to have Alzheimer's? What does it mean to have um, dementia? Uh, what does it mean to have gait issues? And what does it mean that uh, grandmother now wears a diaper? And how that would affect family dynamics. If we prepare our family members who might be a little less educated on kind of what's going on with our patient, it always helps. Um, so I just want to cover kind of that and um, just focus on finding ways to prepare both family and the patient as a way of um, getting through the holidays safely. One of the things that we know is groups are extremely efficacious. We know that those caregivers who find themselves in a group setting have a way to connect with others 
They have a way to feel that they're not alone. They have a way of asking questions that they didn't even think they would have. Um, it provides a nice, supportive, non-judgmental environment. I love being part of groups. I feel like I'm learning a lot when I'm part of the groups, and I feel that patients feel that they're not just connected to their provider, they're not just being talked at, but they have a chance to have discussions. So certainly it's a way to share your stories, it's a way to develop relationships, it's a way to come up with a better plan, and we've had caregivers who say to us that these relationships last for years. And so certainly finding a way to get that emotional support is um, extremely helpful. Um, and sometimes caregivers are surprised, they're first hesitant to go into groups because they feel like they've heard it all, they know it all, and they feel like hearing from others is not going to help. And then when we ask for feedback, they kind of like it and they return to our groups because they enjoy having that connection with other um, folks. So some of the uh, questions that are asked sometimes is what do we do about um, difficult behaviors? What do we do if our uh, patient wonders? What do, do, what do we do if they get irritated, if they get upset, if they behave inappropriately? Um, certainly first acknowledging that this is really upsetting and also something uh, is, can to me make sense about taking a step back and realizing that this is a disease. This doesn't define our patients. That's not who they are. This is a progression of a disease. I think it's really important because it's so easy to get angry when a grandma just yells at a grandkid and they could be slightly inappropriate and you don't know what to do and you want to start screaming at grandma. When in reality, what probably will work best is redirecting. What would work best is just coming into the situation and gently redirecting grandmother or grandfather or an uncle or an aunt and finding a way to reduce what's going on in the environment, change situations, um, and provide a safe environment where other activities could be taking place. Certainly reducing stimuli, one of the things we know is when caregivers and uh, patients travel, that they feel like change in environment could sometimes contribute to additional level of behavioral problems. Um, I sometimes say bring your favorite pillow, bring some pictures with you. If there's certain scent that's being used in the room, bring that with you to kind of familiarize patients um, to their environment. Um, and certainly make sure that the schedule is set, that they're sleeping at the same time, eating at the same time as they used to. Um, signs are really useful, having a sign for where the door is, where the exit is, having a sign for the bathroom. Um, sometimes we suggest in the new environment, putting a tape on the floor so that the patient knows how to get to the bathroom. Locking doors, make sure that it's safe. Um, having an ID bracelet that they could carry with them is really important. Um, sometimes redirecting them by moving on to an activity that's physical could be helpful. So you could do a little bit of breathing, you could do a little bit of exercising with them. And then seeking medical attention. If you're noticing that there is new onset or change in the behavior that makes you suspect that something medical could be going on, such as UTI, certainly call your doctor, call your primary care physician, call your neurologist, call your nurse practitioner. Let them know that you're noticing a change in the behavior. Um, just a little bit more in terms of managing behaviors, redirecting conversations is helpful, making sure that you stay within the routine is helpful, staying grounded yourself, sort of not freaking out, not kind of causing additional level of distress is helpful, um, speaking in a calm tone, voice, making sure that you clearly describe what you're trying to say to the caregiver is helpful, um, using simple, positive, non-threatening language helps, um, limit distractions, so make sure there's less going on and you can kind of control the environment a little bit better. Um, and there's really, we haven't, I haven't seen any studies or I haven't heard any um, anecdotal in kind of descriptions of how arguing helps. So I think getting into an argument with someone who has uh, dementia doesn't help. It also probably doesn't help to get into conflict or argument with the caregiver as well while the caregiver is trying to manage situations. So the less we argue, Better. Um, what are the studies talk, talking about when it comes to benefiting uh, benefits of having support? Reduced ER visits, uh, potential reduction in health costs, fewer office calls for behavioral concerns, uh, more efficient office visits, and increased satisfaction with the care that's provided, and reduced and delayed hospitalization for long-term care. So definitely 
we are very certain that if we take care of our caregivers and if caregivers allow us to help us take care of them, we'll see improvement for both the patient and our caregivers. It's a team effort, and that's why I love being part of this team because you, no, you're not alone. As a caregiver, you're not alone. As a patient, you're not alone. We are definitely all about team approach. Um, your primary care physician, your neurologist, your therapist, your psychiatrist, all should be on the same page. Um, if you have ER visits, you notify your doctor, you notify your um, the patient you're caring for that they had that ER visit. You make sure that there's a outpatient care that's set up if there is a need for hospitalization and community support. So reach out to those associations that are really wonderful and there for you. Um, if you don't care of yourself, who will? And who will be there to take care of your loved ones? And that's a question, it's more of a rhetorical question that we ask a lot, or I ask a lot when I see my caregivers. Um, it's a good idea to plan ahead. It's a good idea to be thinking, what will happen if I get sick tomorrow? What will happen to a person I'm caring for? Can they take care of themselves? Is there a plan B in place? So thinking about power of attorney, health proxy, living will, um, thinking about who will take care of a person that you're caring for, making sure that family members are involved as much as possible and stay informed. Working with attorney really helps. So if you're savvy, you can just get that paperwork done by yourself. That's wonderful. Sometimes it's overwhelming. So if you're overwhelmed, get someone to help you. So just to summarize, uh, we know that there's both physical, psycho psychological, social, and financial constraints. There's ways of improving um, psychological, physical, and cognitive burden. Um, we also know that there is a way that education, psychological help um, is there for caregivers. Um, and we want to make sure that caregivers are aware that that help is available. They just need to be actively seeking it. And if they're not seeking it, we'll be asking questions to help them uh, maybe become a little bit more insightful of how stressed and overwhelmed they might be. Few associations and resources that I truly love. Alzheimer's Association is just an amazing resource. American Parkinson's Disease Association, it's just wonderful. They, um, they have groups, they have ways of reaching out to family members who go through similar um, difficulties. MS Association is wonderful, NIH obviously, and um, AARP is also a great association with a lot of resources in terms of transition care and so on. Um, thank you. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Keith Ciccone. Keith is a nurse specialist working in collaboration with Dr. Oler and Dr. Bao, providing nursing care, assessment, telephone triage, coordination of community resources and services, and also facilitating the deep brain stimulation program. Keith has almost two decades of experience working with patients and families with Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, mo movement disorder, epilepsy, and cognitive impairment. Keith received his Bachelor's of Science in Music Therapy with a minor in Psychology from Anna Maria College in Paxton, Mass. He received his nursing diploma from Chelsea Soldier Home School of Nursing. Please join me in welcoming Keith Ciccone. Thank you, Effie. This morning, I'm going to talk to you about more resources to help caregivers help themselves. There's a great quote from Rosalind Carter that says, there are only four kinds of people in the world. Those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need a caregiver. What we understand is that you're not alone. You do have help around you. Sometimes it may not feel like that. As discussed earlier with Leslie and Irene, they talked about the support groups and resources that I'll further discuss with you this morning. We know the expense of caregiving for your loved one can be extremely costly, and we have to ensure that you are able to take care of yourself as well as your loved one. In earlier speaking, they talked about planning ahead and making a plan. Other sources, such as holding a family conference to discuss future requirements, and as Leslie said earlier, having a case, case 
manager helping you to coordinate that can be instrumental in getting all the pieces that you need. Identifying the services need that you need before you even need them, and most importantly, as a caregiver, you need to take care of yourselves. We want to create advocacies and not advertisements. And we are very fortunate to have a lot of great neurologists that take care of our Parkinson's patients in the community, but a movement disorder specialist has one to two years more experience um, learning about Parkinson's medication, learning about Botox, deep brain stimulation, and well as clinical trials. What patients, family members, and caregivers can do to help physicians, they want to come to their appointment with knowing their medications, being organized, as well as making sure the questions that are being um, addressed have been written down ahead of time to make the effectiveness of your appointment. And in addition to preparing for your neurology visit, you want to make sure you have refills that you need um, taken care of, as well as asking for any services, such as VNA services, or any ancillary services, or any medical needs of equipment. Medication schedules and grids. One thing I like to do is do a medication grid to make sure the medication, the strength of the medication, as well as the dosing and the timing is across in the grid. This helps patients to figure out what medications they're taking in a course of a day, but it will also help your movement disorder doctor if there's any problems such as wearing off or if there's any problems with timing of your medication. And I also like to call it my healthcare quick emergency journal. I like patients to have a three ring binder. And in that binder, I would encourage you to have things such as um, your social security card, your insurance cards, the list of your current medications, the way the medications are filled, what physicians, not only your movement disorder specialist, but your primary care doctor, your ophthalmologist, all those doctors that might be needed. If this three ring binder is located next to a phone, if you still have a landline, that way in an emergency situation, they can just take that binder with them and you know, all that information would be with you as needed. Getting help. One thing is information. Education symposiums like today, programs for the American Parkinson's Disease, Parkinson's Foundation, Michael J. Fox Foundation, Davis Finney Foundations can help you educate yourself on Parkinson's disease and its symptoms and uh, treatments that are available. Support groups, the American Parkinson's Disease established in the 60s, have done support groups throughout um, the past decades. Right now there's probably over 40 support groups in Massachusetts um, that can help you. And if you're viewing us from out of state, you might want to go to the National Association to see if those support groups are available in your area as well. Legal and financial planning. It's most important that you've discussed your legal and financial planning. Understand what a healthcare proxy is understand what a power of attorney is, and making sure all those pieces are in place. There are many resources available through the Mass Bar Association if you need to speak with a legal uh, person for assistance. Service programs, we heard earlier this morning about Anna Dunbar from 110 Fitness and Fox Rehab. Those service programs are available for you to help you take care of your loved ones. Adult day health centers are a great resource for a daily Monday through Friday or a couple days a week for your loved one. In doing so, you will work with your primary care doctor or your movement disorder specialist, and that way you can figure out what's going to be the best center for you and your loved ones. Respite care. I know Leslie spoke earlier about respite care. I know if you have a veteran's um, support, uh, you might qualify for respite care depending on your service eligibility or you might find out through your insurance company if you're entitled to any respite care for one or two weeks that will lessen the stress as a caregiver. In long-term care, um, when we talk about long-term care, sometimes we do have to speak about long-term care, and you can go to the Department of Public Health to get resources, you can speak to your local council on aging, or you can speak with any discharge planners in hospital situations that can help you, direct you in making a decision. Help for the caregiver. You want to learn as much as you can about your medical condition. Parkinson's disease is very involved not only with the motor but the non-motor functions. So you want to make sure you understand all about the medications, 
the side effects and what to expect. And don't play the martyr. I think one of the hardest thing in being a, having been a caregiver myself is the hardest thing for people to do is ask for help. And I think once we understand that we ask for our help, it'll make life easier and we'll have a better experience with our loved ones. Um, we spoke earlier about getting legal and professional advice, and you want to seek out caregivers for information, or sometimes maybe just get a reality check, or is, am I feeling overwhelmed, is it just me, or um, finding out other people having that same experience. And we want to make sure that you, as the caregiver, make sure you have regular breaks to restore your energy and self sense. Whether you're a golfer, whether you are a person that uh, needs to get a facial or a manicure or just go for a walk, uh, we want to make sure that those things are helping you because we want to make sure you take care of you. Support services. There are many support services available in, the age, in your neighborhood. Homemakers and home health agencies. A, that would be helpful to cleaning the house. A uh, handy person. We heard about earlier about not going on the gutters, cleaning out the gutters or doing the lawn. Uh, companion for two to four hours a week. Most agency, v &A agencies have a private uh, pay sector. Um, and we would recommend though, I personally would recommend that when you do get a companion, that you do um, make sure that you uh, find out what their background is and might be beneficial for you to make sure it's with agencies so they're bonded and insured. And ways to make life easier, home delivery services. With COVID, we know that Peapod and Wegman Services have been increasing their business. Um, we spoke with Leslie earlier about private case managers. Um, we also know that v &A services can come to your home to both for skilled nursing, medication management, occupational therapy, home safety evaluations, and physical therapy. Those services are available to you. The only thing with those services like that, all v &A services do need the recommendation and the referral from a physician. And when it comes to rehab services, there are inpatient Parkinson's disease programs here available in Massachusetts that can help for a one to two week, uh, sometimes we call this a tune-up. And when it comes to prescriptions, there are ways that we can use pill pack, which is a pre-pack uh, medication dosing, or Eaton's uh, Pharmacy is another agency that does the same thing. We want to make sure that you have education and support. We've heard that the American Parkinson's disease has been long-standing in helping the Parkinson's community. For the Young Onset Parkinson's, there's the APDA National Young Onset Group. There's another group, We Move. The World Parkinson's Congress has been going on um, for the past several years, and that happens every two years. We also have the Parkinson's Foundation, the Michael J. Fox Foundation, as well as their clinical trials and the Davis Finney Foundation and the Melvin Weinstein Foundation. There are many services available to you. It's just helping you to navigate all the services. As well as the other information we talked about, I've given you some other resources, such as the AARP Family Caregivers. Um, they have online community uh, programs. They also have a free caregiver guide. This Family Caregiver Alliance the National Alliance for Caregiving, Caregivers Action Network, and for our veterans, this Department of Veterans Affairs, we want to make sure, we always encourage that you as a veteran have um, spoken with your local agency to ensure that all your veterans benefits that you're entitled to have been uh, granted. And if they have not, if you need more services, we do recommend that you speak with the nurse, the physician, the movement sort of specialist to ensure that you're getting all services due for you. And um, my references, yeah, I went, um, was these the references I used when I did my research. And the last thing I'd like to leave you is, is a quote. You are a treasure, a modern day angel, a warrior when times are tough, a soothing balm when there is pain, a shining light when there is darkness. Today we celebrate you, the caregiver. For further information, how you can speak with me, I'm here at St. Elizabeth's, and there's my phone and fax number, and thank you so much for joining us today. So we have some questions that have been posed to us today. And the first question comes up, I don't want to bother my children with asking for help as they're so busy with their lives. I am just exhausted and I feel I cannot keep this up. 
Leslie, I do want to start with you. What would you, as a case manager, when your situation, you say to family members? I would probably begin with acknowledging that the person has stated that they don't want to bother um, their family members. And the reason that the discussion has even come up is because they need additional assistance. So talking about what could be provided for them if they did talk to their family members might help to clarify the value of that, even though you acknowledge that the family members may be busy. Um, surprisingly enough, many times family members want to be able to help and want to be able to participate. So having that conversation would be first. Irene, what have you encountered with questions like this? So we try to use uh, a little bit of motivational interviewing with caregivers who say to us that they're overwhelmed, and we encourage them to develop their own voice and speak up uh, as a way of letting others know that they're tired, and sometimes even acknowledging to themselves is easier when they said it out loud. And also, we sometimes ask, uh, family members who are caregivers, what would happen if you end up not being able to care for your loved one? <clears throat> You're trying to protect your kids or your other family members. You don't want to burden them. But what's going to happen if you're no longer able to care for them, if you're fully burdened? The burden is going to be your family members. So the more we can help you as a caregiver stay healthier, the more likely you're going to be able to care for the person longer and not overburden the family members. Great, thank you. Next question I see is, why should I pay for a private case manager? My daughter is a daughter's nurse and can take care of me, right? Right, within, <laughs> within their ability and their area of expertise. Um, you're way ahead of the game with having a nurse within your family, so that is wonderful. Um, many times, um, nurses are focused in one specific area or two specific areas and may not have the overall um, picture of what other resources could be available and how to navigate other systems that they have not been exposed to or have been working in. Um, <clears throat> many times, uh, a team meeting is what I would call them, where the care manager would help to guide that daughter that is the nurse into uh, down a, an avenue that might be a little bit more helpful and a little bit more complete. Um, <clears throat> care manager has a broader overview of how insurances work, eligibility factors, of what's uh, covered under insurance, what is not we are to go to look for resources to ask the questions and seek out the answers to achieve the family and the person's goals thank you leslie i mean another question has come up is there counseling available for myself as a caregiver or is there any special programs that you do or that's available in the community for sure there's tons of resources which is why american uh, Parkinson's Association, American Alzheimer's Association really comes to mind. Um, it feels overwhelming to ask for help, but once you ask, the resources are available. Um, medical insurance covers individual therapy, so it's always good to reach out to your insurance company to see who is covered under your insurance, but certainly there are both caregiver, care receiver groups, care receiving groups, and caregiving groups. And that's available. I think it's a matter of family members asking for the services. And if your primary care physician can provide with direct resource, another provider might be able to. So it's always a good idea to cast a wide net, net and ask around. Absolutely. Great. And our last question comes in, I don't have a care partner. My family lives out of state and I'm all alone. What would you recommend? I really want to start with you first. I would recommend starting with your medical care team. I would recommend talking to your doctors, and that would be my first step. My first step would be reach out to medical care professionals, 
and figure out how the system can start helping you. That will take a little bit of burden and open up a little bit of room for looking into other resources. Uh, groups, uh, bigger associations, uh, neighbors, and the moment you find yourself in a support group, you're no longer alone. The moment you find yourself talking to a primary care physician, a neurologist, a psychiatrist, you're not alone. So at that moment, seeking help becomes a little bit easier. Thank you, Ari. Leslie, what would you like to add, please? Um, my thought is <clears throat> reaching out to the senior centers in your own community are a great resource for uh, people that are feeling alone. Um, they can help in general navigation and directing you to the resources that are local at your level. They may have volunteers that could even participate um, in, in, uh, in a service of watching the person, assisting with food, um, doing errands, things like that. But once you connect with the local level of the senior center, I think you'll also, as Irene says, not feel so alone. Well, Irene and Leslie, we thank you for your participation today. And if they can help, their their websites are up to, for your assistance. And again, we thank you for joining us. Now I have the pleasure of introducing Wendy Oleksiak. Wendy Oleksiak is the Vice President and Principal of the Wendy Oleksiak Group and Compass at Compass Real Estate in Hingham. Ms. Oleksiak is a registered nurse and has had a successful career for many years at Mass General Hospital. She holds a Bachelor's of Science in Nursing from the University of Vermont. She was the recipient of Partner in Excellence in recognition of outstanding performance and commitment to excellence in care from MGH. Her years of nursing have transferred into her current career with clear communication, honesty, hard work, professionalism, and have paved the road in becoming one of Boston's top 20 agents. Please welcome Ms. Wendy Olexia. Good morning, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Uh, today my goal is to make the moving process stress-free and seamless, and hopefully these suggestions are something that you can apply to your current situation. Knowing when it's the right time to downsize, this is a question I'm asked frequently. Probably the number one trigger is stretching the budget, and people uh, start to feel that when they can no longer cut the lawn, um, clean the house, clear the gutters, um, just general maintenance of the property, uh, the house, the home upkeep becomes overwhelming. Often our vacant rooms, and the way I, I try to um, help people see what's going on in the house is I say, kind of draw a little um, floor plan of your house and cross out the rooms that you're not using. And they kind of quickly see that they're, only, they're down to one or two rooms. So they just don't need the space anymore. Um, and you need a different layout. Maybe the laundry's in the basement and you can't navigate that anymore or the bedrooms are upstairs or even the entry to the house has stairs. And, they're just um, just too, too much trouble to navigate. So if these things are true about you, downsizing is the right choice. Sorting blinds. When people first start to think about moving, they kind of shake their head. It's just too much to take in. So what I do is I say, break it in, down into four categories. What are you gonna keep? What are you gonna store? What are you gonna sell or give away? And what's trash? Start with one small goal, and that can just be a dresser or a closet or a box, um, just something so that you're always feeling like you're making progress, but it's not overwhelming. How to prioritize what you are taking with you. If it's never made it out of the box, it no longer fits your style, it falls into the I might need this someday category, it's older out of date, examples of that might be a record player, um, uh, cassette player, um, things like that. If they're books and you're not going to read to them again, they're not coming with you, an abandoned project, uh, maybe you started sewing something, assembling trains or planes, um, 
or other hobby supplies, or it hasn't been touched in a year. Also, furniture that won't fit in a new space. I have had clients who have looked for over a year to bring the piano with them, um, or a desk or something that um, had sentimental value. Try to save yourself the agony of, of doing that and just be realistic and only bring the furniture that fits into a new space. Possible storage items. So things to think about. Paperwork and documents. If you have years and years of bank statements, um, your taxes, all, if it's over five years old, you can toss it. If that makes you nervous and you still want to have those, you can take them to a office shop or somebody can do it at home for you, but you can have everything scanned. So even if you do toss it, you will have a place to find it. Items with sentimental value. If something is uh, light sensitive or temperature sensitive, like a piece of art, um, you know, you're going to have to think about where that might go if it can't be um, placed in a new home. Um, family heirlooms, kind of the same thing. Holiday decorations. Some people have lots and lots of Santa's villages and, and things like that. Um, seasonal supplies, gardening tools, ornaments. Um, you know, a lot of times people have things for the 4th of July and and things like that. So where's all that stuff going to go? What makes sense? Now that you've become a super sorter, what's next? It is time to decide who is packing. Are you hiring uh, somebody or do you have family, uh, excuse me, family members um, that can help? Be realistic about what you can and can't do. Um, moving can, it's going to drain you emotionally even, even though it's an exciting thing sometimes. Um, so you really need to pace yourself. Um, so who's going to help? Next, you're going to obtain boxes and moving supplies, including an indelible marker to label boxes. The more careful you are when you pack, it will really save you time and energy uh, when, when it comes time to unpack. So, Boxes, you can try to get them from liquor stores, grocery stores, but you can order them also from staples. You can also ask your realtor. A lot of times I'm able to uh, take boxes from somebody who just closed on the house and transfer them over to a client. So um, there's a couple ways to get boxes. And you, want, you also don't want huge, huge boxes. You want, you know, people can't pick up or move safely. Um, just, just be careful about how you pack everything. Um, consider renting a storage pod or storage locker. There are, I'm sure you're probably familiar with them, these plastic pods that can be dropped off in your driveway and you can kind of, you know, you pay a monthly rate, but you can slowly be packing that pod. Um, it, you want to be careful about things that are very valuable going in there or temperature sensitive but that can kind of sit in your driveway for a while. Then it can be picked up and delivered to your new home, or it can actually be go into storage for a while while you're in the process of moving. So those are, those are great. Um, create a moving file to keep track of your receipts, contracts, and other relocation paperwork. In the beginning, you know, you're taking a couple small notes, but you might have movers coming in to give you estimates. Um, you've order things to help you with the supply. You might be looking at a service that's going to help you with the transition. Keep all of those things in one place. Uh, cluster packing. Pick the time of day that you are most energetic. It's, as I keep saying, it's really draining. So kind of pick a day. So every day at 11, I typically feel good and I'm going to pack from 11 to 12. Uh, let's see. Call moving companies to obtain quotes. Certain dates are less expensive. Um, August 31st is the most expensive day of the year to move because you're also competing with college students. So uh, keep that in mind. Time to arrange for items that fall into the category of sell give to be distributed. Selling giving away. Um, I have a lot of clients that actually do this through Facebook. 
if you don't have a Facebook account, ask a friend or family member who does. And this is just one way, but uh, it's pretty effective. You don't need professional photos, just to you know, line things up and let, post them. We'll try to group them together, have photos done, and that person can place them on, I, I live in Situate, so I'd be putting it up on the Situate Facebook town, web, town site, and um, often stuff goes in a couple days or even that day. It's a really easy way to get rid of things. If you're worried about people coming to your home, um, ask for help. You know, you are giving your address, so just be mindful of that. Yard sale, the old-fashioned yard sale. Estate sales can be done for a fee through companies. And they come into your home, they kind of walk through, they say, these are the things that will sell. Those things are trash and they need to be get rid of, gotten rid of. They're, that's a great way to do it. And they will charge you, they will take a piece of every item that sells, but they really, they kind of force you to organize. The word organize again. Um, things to kind of start thinking about, uh, use or dispose of frozen food, cleaning solutions, uh, aerosol cans that can't be packed safely. Um, you're gonna want your medical records if you're moving out of state or only to transfer practices. Uh, also include dentist, optician, and veterinarian if you have a pet. Uh, order new ID tags for your pet. One thing that was really uh, surprising and upsetting to me when I first became a realtor is the fact that a lot of people lose pets when they move. So be careful about making arrangements for the pet for moving day, um, even a couple days after, you might want to board them in a kennel, have a friend or family member take care of them. But you do want to have their new uh, address on their collar. So if they do get away, um, you know, and somebody picks them up and tries to find you, they know where to call. Cancel subscriptions, transfer mail, and don't forget to update your Amazon account. Whoops, I'm gonna go backwards, I think. Okay, electronics. Take photos of how computers, TVs, and other electronics are connected. So, I mean, I'm looking at this computer here. There's a couple wires. I would take a big picture, and I might even pull the cords out a little bit and take another picture so that you can sit down, look at your phone, or, or however you look at pictures, and be able to plug things in uh, just how, how they work, so devices will work. Um, place the parts in labeled Ziploc baggies. So I would take a picture maybe of my computer, put all the parts in, and I know, and label it, and so when I take it out, I know right how to set it back up again. Transfer utilities. A lot of these are pretty obvious. Cable, internet, gas, oil, Electric water, trash, recycling, telephone, security system, lawn care, and housekeeping. The number one recommendation that I have is do not turn off the gas service to your home. On moving day, that will cause, I mean, on um, closing day, that will cause a big problem because the people who need to do the final walkthrough on your property, if the gas is turned off, it will take three or four days to, to turn it back on. You can transfer the account when you call the gas company, but don't turn off the service to the house. And what I also say about the other utilities, I kind of say the same, don't cancel them on the day that you're moving. Give it two or three days after, just so, again, we can do the walkthrough. I know some people are moving into the home can turn the lights on and, and have a little bit of time to get settled. Preparing for moving day. I tell people, uh, Prepare like you're going on vacation for a couple days because you're going to have all these boxes, you're going to be so tired. Um, you just want to have a suitcase where you've got everything you need right in front of you, kind of keeping it simple. So you're going to put your shoes, clothing, um, important documents, pajamas, toiletries, medications, and pet items, you know, some food or things. So everything will be right there. Um, pack a movie box with your scissors, tape, towels, toilet paper bed linens, tools, light bulbs, and trash bags. Arrange for trash pickup. That's another uh, thing that sometimes comes up at closing. 
on the last day when people are doing their walkthrough, if you have a lot of trash in the driveway, bags, you know, all over the place, it will be very upsetting to the buyer and it often causes uh, uh, little hiccups with the closing. Again, plan to pace yourself. Ask a family member or friend to be with you. So the movers are there. They're looking at boxes, asking you lots of questions. If you have somebody else who's there with you who can kind of also help direct them, and if you need to sit down and take a break, that's not going to slow the moving process down. So have somebody there. Um, have all keys, manuals, uh, security codes. If you have a, a garage door that has a little uh, pad outside, um, let's see, garage door openers labeled and organized for the next homeowner. Just put everything together and leave it on the kitchen counter. So with the walkthrough, they can see that everything's there. The agent can take the key to give to their client, the new buyer, um, after the sale is recorded, and that will help things go very smoothly. Uh, alert your neighbors to expect a moving truck. People probably will want to say bye and, and best of luck, and you might want to let them know where you're going. Um, but you do want to let them know that there will be a truck, and hopefully it won't block their driveway or you know, cause inconvenience for them. Um, arrange a spot, as I kind of said before, to sit down if you need a little break. Um, and then finally, do a, a sweep of all closets, cabinets, attic, and shed. The buyers can get upset about small things. I recently had a home that had a maybe a two foot cactus and the seller forgot to pack it. So the buyers uh, would not sign until the cactus was removed from the property. And that now sits in my bathroom, I love it. <laughs> uh, housing options, what's next? Um, take your time and think about where you need to go. Are you just downsizing? Um, maybe a 55 plus community is for you. It, those are really maintenance free living. You basically aren't responsible for anything but the interior of your home. They're doing snow plowing, um, cleaning the gutters, gardening, uh, all, all the stuff outside. So you, you can live there, not have to worry. A lot of uh, 55 plus communities have a very active social calendar. Um, I have a listing right now and they have, um, it's a mile from the beach. So they have a club that walks to the beach every day. They have also a dog walking club that walks their dogs together. Um, they have bingo, they have uh, book clubs, they have golf buddies, um, there's a, a men's uh, cocktail hour. So there's a lot to do. You don't have to participate in them. You might kind of feel like I already have my friends, but um, you might be surprised you know, how much fun it is to be part of the community. Uh, okay, assisted living. Um, if you think that you are going to need a little more care, um, you might want to look into this type of uh, residence. There's on-site help with uh, daily living activities, and that can just be somebody coming in and filling your um, pillbox, and it can be all the way up to helping you bathe, um, preparing meals. Uh, you are able to be in a home-like setting, and there are uh, varying levels of specialized care. So if you have a, a little setback or have um, a small procedure done, they can sometimes move you into um, kind of the, the rehabilitation setting that they have on site. And once you're back up and running, you can move back to your unit, but you still have all of your friends and everything that you know uh, available to you. Um, planned communities. Uh, recently, I have sold a lot of homes in Plymouth. Plymouth is really uh, targeting the um, uh, 55 plus crowd, and they are creating communities that have an on site hairdresser, um, um, its own post office, the grocery store. Everything is in one spot, and um, you know, they also will have a lot of activities. So uh, I forgot to mention bakery, that's where I like to go. Um, but those work very well. And then multi-generational living in the moving in with family. Uh, in the last few years, I've really noticed a shift and I've had a lot more requests to find a house that has 
an uh, in-law suite or at least a first floor bedroom um, and try to see if, if generations can live together. I just had a family where I moved in. There's four ladies, women, um, from four different generations, and it was really fun to have them all look together and bring them back together as a family. Remember that it will all be worth it. Uh, you decided to move for a reason, even though it's, uh, you feel a little bit like the earth is tipped on its side, you will get through it. Um, lean on your realtor, call with questions. We know how to solve problems. Uh, don't feel embarrassed or worried. Everything um, can be taken care of. And change is hard, even good change, even when you're happy about it, it's still a shift. Um, but it can bring unexpected opportunities and you should look forward to the next chapter. Thank you. Okay, I guess we have a couple of questions from the community. So let me uh, go ahead and, and answer those. I have been in my house for 50 years. My children live out of state and I am selling my home. Are there companies that can help me declutter and downsize my home? Yes. Recently, a lot of uh, people have, have picked up on this need and they have created uh, senior transition assistance um, businesses. So they can help with the estate sale. They can um, actually create a digital inventory of all your belongings. They'll come in and as they're helping you pack, you, you know, they're, you're sitting there and they're taking a picture of every single item so you know what's going. Um, they will do things like uh, take a look at the new, if you know where you're moving to, the new floor plan to help you decide what furniture will fit. Uh, they will uh, run an estate sale for you. Um, they will help gather your medical records. So there's, there's assistance from just doing an estate sale all the way up to you sit back and do nothing. So there are, there are companies that do that. I have a, a nice list that I'd be happy to share. Uh, where do I begin to look for a 55 or older community or assisted living? Uh, your realtor will know the different uh, 55 we call them plus communities. Um, what you want to do first is obviously figure out where you want to go. So once you've targeted a couple different areas, uh, let your realtor know this is where I'm looking and are there any other nearby towns that I haven't thought of that have uh, communities that I should consider. Uh, assisted living. That's something that you probably want to ask your, your doctor's practice about. Um, they usually have either a nurse or a social worker that has contacts with uh, different assisted living facilities and they can steer you um, to where they are. Uh, okay, next question. I'm not ready to move. Should I start thinking about downsizing and my future options for living? Yes. Um, the decluttering and organizing doesn't have to happen um, only for a move. It, it's, you feel lighter when you throw things away with um, you know, our recent uh, time period at home. Everybody was cleaning closets and things like that. And it just you just feel better anyways to know that you're not managing junk anymore. Um, and yes, you should always think about future options if you are sleeping downstairs on the first floor, maybe in the dining room because the, the stairs are too hard or you're doing things like that, you probably have a move coming up in the near future. We hope this morning's program has been a source of education, inspiration, and resources for you and your family. We thank all of our presenters for a wonderful job and for taking time out of their busy schedule. In addition, we would like to acknowledge and thank Brian Murphy Mary Crotty, Eric Faddis, Rachel Wiegan, and Lauren Green for their assistance. Without them, today's program would not have been possible. We look forward to future programs, whether virtual like today or hopefully in person in the future. On behalf of the Neurology Department at St. Elizabeth's Medical Center, we wish you and your family a happy and healthy fall season. Be well, be safe. Again, many thanks. <laughs>